Good evening. I'm Ron Patterson, president of Shadron State College, and welcome. In 2006, the late Esther Pilster gave a gift of ranch, ranch land in northwest Nebraska near Whitney and Dawes County to the Mari Sandoz Heritage Society. The gift, which established an endowment, was a tribute to her late husband, Raleigh, who grew up on the ranch and his parents, John and Grace Pilster. As a beloved teacher and school administrator for 44 years, Esther served 29 years as a principal at Boyd Elementary School in Omaha. Esther wanted her gift to honor the courage and tenacity shown by Raleigh's parents and others who lived in the Great Plains. The Pilster Great Plains Lecture Series and other programs funded by the endowment and this wonderful gift. Shadron State College is proud and honored to be the site for this 2023 Pilster Great Plains Lecture and Sando Symposium. At this time, I would like to welcome Ms. Shannon Smith, President of the Sandoz Heritage Society. Oh, this is going way down. <laughs> they didn't give me a box. I always forget that. Um, thank you so much, President Ron, for welcoming us here and sharing how come we are able to do this kind of lecture. Um, I am the president of the Mari Sandoz Heritage Society and our organization is uh, the reason why we're able to put on this kind of event. It's a, a labor of love by a large group of people that I'm gonna share with you in a moment. But I wanna start out by saying that Mari believed that it was very important for us to understand the past in order to face the challenges of the present. She was a writer with a cause, and that cause was justice for American Indians. She was an activist, an ally, and an advocate. She was one of the earliest historians in the United States to emphasize that we could not really know American history without knowing and learning Native American history. If she was standing here right now, she would tell us to think about the land upon, our, upon which our feet are planted. Who has trod here before? Who has lived here before? And how has the land changed hands and been transformed? To do that requires us to acknowledge the history of dispossession of indigenous peoples who know this place as their own. The Mari Sando Society has not formally adopted a land acknowledgement statement but we can't be representatives of Mari Sandoz without making proper acknowledgement for what is going on today. And so we believe that our work is going just beyond just acknowledgement of past injustice. We have to do more in this area and our group of people are going to work devotedly to figure out what our actions are to, su to support and promote Sandoz's legacy of being passionate about American Indian justice. A few years after her death in 1966, a group of people here at Chadron State College decided to form an organization to preserve her legacy. Soon, a nonprofit organization, the Mari Sandoz Heritage Society, was formed. For five decades, this marvelous and wonderful, productive organization has erected historical markers, established signs at her grave, and yes, we know they need to be repaired right now. We've published books, we've created tours, and we've put on events like the one we are hosting here on Shadron today and tomorrow. I would like to ask the board members who are here today to please stand up. This is a little bit under half of the people who are faculty in schools and universities all around the region, as well as people who are passionate about Mari Sandoz. We want to make sure and ask you all to go and learn about our organization. Please, uh, if you did not receive our newsletter and learn about this event there, we ask that you sign up. We have so many great things going on and we hope that at some point you will consider becoming a member of our society. So on behalf of Mari Sandoz Heritage Society, I wanna welcome you here, and I'd like to introduce one of our board members, Dr. Kurt Kimbacher, who will introduce the Great Plains Pilster Lecture tonight. Thank you very much. 
Good evening. <laughs> Andrew R. Graybill is the director of the William P. Clements Center for the Study of the Southwest. Is that right? And a professor of history at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. The um, topic of today's lecture is what's so great about the Great Plains? It might be this book, The Great Plains, by Walter Prescott Webb. I'll let you guys have this conversation, but if you're interested, it's for sale at the back uh, after the lecture, and uh, Dr. Graybill, who wrote the introduction to the latest uh, edition, would be glad to sign it for you. And there's also a, a great book called The Beaverman uh, back there by Ms. Lori Sin that's uh, um, by Mari Sandos is kind of why we're here. Um, Graybill is uniquely qualified to have this discussion or lead this discussion. He's a Texan uh, from the southern reaches of the Great Plains. Walter Prescott Webb was a Texan. This book was published in 1931, and it was actually quite significant. When I was uh, starting my master's program, we read it um, with the concept that this started regional history in the United States. So it's, uh, it's a, a pretty prominent book. It's not without its flaws, but it's still important, okay? Um, if you wanna know more about Andy, I'll call him Andy from this point on, his uh, CV, his curriculum detail is on the uh, Southern Methodist website. His list of publications is extensive. He writes uh, academic presses. He writes for the Texas Monthly and the Wall Street Journal. So his, his array of ability to uh, write to different voices is uh, pretty stunning in my mind. He's an uh, excellent teacher. I first met him when I was a graduate student at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. He was uh, junior faculty at the time. Um, popular with the students for his generosity and his intellectual fervor, um, and just kind of an all-around decent guy. So um, I guess without further ado, I give you Andy Graybill and what's so great about the Great Plains. So I am taller than Sharon but smaller than Kurt. Good evening. That was very nice, Kurt. I, being called an all-around decent guy, I don't hear that often enough, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that home with me. Um, let me begin by, uh, by thanking Kurt. Uh, I was thrilled when he got in touch with me. I don't know, gosh, um, Shannon and I were talking about this I was talking with Elizabeth about this a moment ago. I don't know how long this has been on the calendar for quite a while, and it is really, uh, it's, a, it's a thrill to be here. So I was uh, absolutely flattered when Kurt invited me to give uh, the Pilster Lecture. I've known Kurt for a couple of decades, as he said. Um, we overlapped at, uh, at UNL, and I remember the time, uh, or I've known Kurt long enough to remember when he had a ponytail that ran all the way down uh, the length of his back, which I guess I can tell the story. His mentor, who I'll mention in a moment, insisted he said, you gotta cut that, Kurt, if you're gonna get a job. Um, I think he probably could have gotten away with it, but uh, at any rate, um, thanks very much, Kurt. Thanks also to other folks who've helped make my visit possible, especially Elizabeth Chase and Courtney Kuba. Uh, very grateful for the hospitality. And thanks, too, to the uh, Mari Sandoz Historical Society Board and Administrators, and of course, um, to Shadron State College for, uh, for making all this possible. It's really, it's wonderful to be here, and I don't just say that to be polite. I would say that, but I really mean it, um, because uh, I love Nebraska. I taught for almost a decade at the university. I don't think I've ever totally gotten over having left uh, the Cornhusker State and the good life. Um, in fact, when I was driving down the other day from, uh, um, from Rapid City uh, and crossed into Nebraska, I was very cheered to see that sign that welcomed me back to the good life. I believe it. I visited Shattern only once before in 2008. I was telling Kurt about this when I made a 2,000 mile drive um, from Lincoln uh, all the way up to Fort Union on the uh, North Dakota uh, Montana border and then ultimately back to Lincoln. But I spent one night in, um, in Chadron. It was my last night and then I headed uh, sort of east, southeast on Highway 2. Um, but I was here the weekend that deer season opened. Um, and although I grew up uh, around hunters in Texas, I've never seen so much orange and camouflage in my life. It was amazing. Um, it was uh, one of my more vivid memories of, uh, of, of Chadron. But I've never been to the Sandoz Conference before despite my time in Nebraska 
and the fact that uh, one of my mentors, John Wonder, who I'm sure is a name familiar to many of you all, uh, was always encouraging me to make the trip. It was hard at a couple of young kids, and it was hard for me to get away at the time. Um, but uh, it is poignant to be here less than a month after John's memorial service in Lincoln, which was over Labor Day, um, because he really loved this place. I think of all the things that John was involved with across the course of his career, this one might have been sort of the closest to his heart. I know how much this place meant to him, um, the people who uh, make this society go. Um, and then, of course, the work of, um, of Mary Sandoz, Mari Sandoz. Uh, I was telling Dave Nesham that I've gotten that wrong since the beginning, but he told me, don't mess it up tonight, and I just did. <laughs> Mari Sandoz. Um, so, uh, and let me say, I'm a big Sandoz fan. I wrote an introduction to a reissue of The Beaverman some years ago. Um, Old Jewels was probably the first thing that I read when I moved to Nebraska. I'd never been here before 2003. Um, Love the Cattleman, was just reading Ron Hull's introduction the other day and was thinking I'm doing some work on Longhorns and was uh, amazed to be reminded that Ron knew uh, Mari well, uh, in fact. Um, and of course, uh, Crazy Horse is just uh, a foundational work um, for people like me who are interested in the history of Native peoples on the plains. Um, a quick caveat, uh, my PowerPoint guru, um, my ex-wife, uh, not available to help me any longer um, in preparing my PowerPoint slides. So um, I'm gonna illustrate with words. That's entirely true. I'm not much of a fan of PowerPoint to begin with, but um, I've been kind of stranded in the last couple of years. So I'm gonna do my best to paint with words tonight, like Walter Prescott. But let me first ask, before Kurt held up a copy of the book, how many of you know The Great Plains? How many of you know the book? If not having read it, but by title, okay, all right. Enough of you that I'm gonna to have to tell the truth tonight. Okay, um, let me give just a little bit of background uh, about the book, which will be redundant for those of you who know it, um, but uh, critical for those of you who don't. Um, so while I was writing my dissertation a long time ago, many, many years ago, my dissertation advisor who wrote a really wonderful book called The Destruction of the Bison and Environmental History, which is probably the best sort of single volume work uh, on the near extinction of the buffalo and really foundational work of Great Plains history. And he said to me something along the lines of, uh, quote, Look, like it or not, you are now a historian of the Great Plains because I was writing about the Texas Rangers and the Canadian Mounties and thinking about what it meant for them to police their respective edges of this Great Plains bioregion. Um, I, he said, what do you have to add to the work of Walter Prescott Webb or Donald Worcester or Elliot West or others? So for a moment, it was kind of a slight thrill for me to be mentioned in the company of such folks, but I think it was more of a challenge than a compliment. Um, but I felt an affinity for Walter Prescott Webb ever after, perhaps especially because he's a fellow Texan, or was, I should say, a fellow Texan. Uh, he has been gone for quite a while at this point. Um, but I've wrestled with his legacy. It, as Kurt mentioned, and those of you who read the book know, uh, it's, uh, it's a really important book, but not without its problems. Um, and I've revisited it over and over again and had to sort of ask myself exactly what does it mean that I'm so drawn to it because it's got a complex history, um, which I'll get into in just a moment. Uh, I should say that this is drawn from a, a retrospective that I published in 2021 that doubles as an introduction to this new edition of the book that was published a couple of years ago by the University of Nebraska Press. Um, uh, and I should say that some of you probably know the editor-in-chief there, Bridget Berry, and I think one of the reasons that she was so eager to republish the book is that she wanted it to have a new cover. Um, the old one, uh, I think the last edition was from the early 80s, and uh, it has a picture of a combine in silhouette which I always found kind of charming, but it did look very late 70s, early 80s. So I have a feeling that Bridget agreed to work with me on this reissue because she wanted a new book cover. Um, I'd like to think it's because she wanted my introduction, but I'm honest with myself. Okay, so 
Uh, the Great Plains was published to sweeping acclaim in 1931, and the New York Times ran a glowing assessment in what is sort of the, um, uh, kind of the forerunner of the New York Times book review. And uh, a pretty prominent historian described it as one of the most original and significant contributions to the study of the American West. Actually, I should say it was not a historian who wrote that, it was a journalist who was very impressed with Webb's writing style. But the important point is that scholars loved it as well. It's a guy named Henry Steele Commager, who was one of the most important historians of the first half of the 20th century. And he said in another newspaper, quote, both its technique and its conclusions should find application to the whole field of American history. And considering this was a book about the plains, um, uh, I think it is, and which basically established regional history, um, I don't think that people were saying such things about most books written about the West at that time. There were insights that could be found there that might speak to more than just these regional interests. Webb, I think, certainly thought that he was speaking to, or hoped to speak to, a national audience. Anyway, the book won um, the 1933 Lubat Prize, no longer awarded, but it was presented at that time every year, every five years, I should say, by Columbia University to the best book in the social sciences published during that span. A lot of books on the social sciences and a lot of disciplines represented under that umbrella, so Webb's book got a lot of attention even at the time. In 1950, as American historians took stock of their field at mid-century, um, many marked the Great Plains as among the handful of most important books in American history published since 1900. Now, that's all well and good, but it has not aged very well in the academy for a variety of reasons. It's more cited than read. I love the fact that Kurt read it as a master student, is that right? It's a, that's a lot to force on a master's student, um, let alone a doctoral student. Um, but at any rate, uh, it's much more cited these days than actually read. It's got some pretty serious conceptual and methodological limitations, uh, especially, I mean, above all, it's racism, which I've got a lot to say about. Um, but notwithstanding those considerable caveats, and those are not minor, um, I'm gonna make a case, or I'm gonna try to, for its continued relevance, even as it closes in on its 100th birthday. Okay, so the book has got a famous origin story, I mean, to the extent that anybody cares, but in the profession, uh, certainly this is well known. So supposedly, and some people when I have presented this as fact have said, you sure? And I say, well, the story's been told often enough that I'm just repeating the legend at this point. Um, but this is certainly how Webb described it. He said that uh, on a cold, rainy night, truly, uh, in February 1922, uh, he had what he described as a, quote, moment of synthesis, as a storm pounded on the roof of the modest house that he shared with his wife uh, in Austin, where he was working on a master's thesis at the University of Texas. And what Webb said, um, and he wrote about this some years later in an unpublished uh, autobiography, was that for whatever reasons it dawned on him that evening that it was the six shooter and not the rifle that actually won the West, or won conquest of the West for Anglos over native peoples. And he said that from that, other realizations dawned on him really quickly, um, leading to the conclusion that distinctive environmental conditions on the Great Plains that were so different from those in the East, and here's the payoff line, quote, have bent and molded Anglo-American life, have destroyed traditions, and have influenced institutions in a most singular manner. Now, I love this, as he said later on in this unpublished memoir that he uh, was writing in uh, the early 1940s, quote, I had no proof, but I knew I was right. I had to be. All the investigation remained to be done, but that was nothing. I mean, I love that. Um, and for the graduate students, if there's some in the audience, you can't quite get away with that. Probably couldn't then, definitely cannot now, but that's what he said. Um, uh, and he went off to the University of Chicago at that point, after having finished this master's thesis on the Texas Rangers at the University of Texas. And he went to Chicago, quote, to seek the accursed PhD. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But it was a debacle because Webb, as you might have gotten from a couple of these uh, quotations, is a stubborn and very determined man. And as one of his uh, graduate school classmates, very prominent 
Later, a very prominent Civil War historian named Avery Craven said that Webb basically just refused to listen to his faculty members at Chicago. He was convinced that he was right, and they didn't have a whole lot to teach him. He was there simply to get the degree. It did not work out quite as he expected, because he failed his first year exams, and he headed home to Texas, broke and broken. He said later that he learned but one lesson in the Windy City, quote, don't take an idea, an original idea, into a graduate school. Um, he was still bitter about this more than two decades later. This is a point that he made when he was giving the address as the president of the American Historical Association, which is the leading academic organization for people who work uh, on, uh, on all fields of history. He made this a line in the address that he delivered in 1955. So, you know, 30 years later, he was still kind of rubbing his hands about how enraged he was by his treatment at Chicago. For for which, I might add, he was largely responsible. Um, but for those of you who are academics, you will know that you know, no grudge can be held for too long in academia. Anyway, he went back to the University of Texas, kind of hat in hand, embarrassed by his experience in Chicago, uh, and uh, he spent the rest of his career there at UT as a graduate student and as a professor. Back in Austin, he resolved, quote, to write history as I saw it from Texas and not as it appeared in some distant center of learning. He finished a draft of what became the Great Plains in five months, and he recalled later on that he wrote the book, quote, in a state of suppressed emotion uh, because his central actors, white settlers, um, quote, had long been my people and I sought to explain them to others. He remembered decades later that it was, quote, the happiest half year of my life, to which I say, get a hobby, dude. Um, but he did love working on this book. Uh, Texas awarded him the PhD in 1932. I think this is fascinating. So The Great Plains is published in 1931, um, but it basically presents it as a published book in lieu of his dissertation, and the University of Texas awards him his doctorate. For those of you who are historians out there, it's a little bit like what I think happened with a really prominent environmental historian, Bill Cronin, who wrote Nature's Metropolis, which is just an extraordinary book, every bit the equal of the Great Plains in its own right, um, and kind of gave it to a dissertation committee as a published book and said, voila, give me the degree, crown me. Um, so Webb done that first in 1932. The argument of the book is simple and elegant, and I think it'll probably ring true for folks um, from Nebraska and from certainly the Central and Western Plains. Namely, it's that the 98th Meridian, which conveniently runs right through Texas, just east of Austin, so that Webb could include Austin um, as part of the West. I'll tell you what I mean in just a moment. But he said that this 98th Meridian that runs, you know, obviously from the North Pole to the South Pole, that passes right through the Great Plains to the heart of the country, is an institutional fault line. And that Anglo-Americans who settled there this region beyond the 98th meridian, uh, adapted to the region through ingenious technological innovations. Um, the Six Shooter was one. For those of you who've read the book or may have read about it, what are the other two? Do you remember? The things that made life for Anglo settlers on the Great Plains possible. The Six Shooter, of course, for being able to be fired quickly uh, from horseback, um, quickly and accurately from horseback in combat with Native Americans. What are the other two inventions that made Anglo settlement possible? Barbed wire, absolutely, or as we pronounce it in Texas, barbed wire, um, which is critical, of course, because there's not a lot of wood for fencing. Um, so it's a much more sort of efficient way uh, to, uh, to build a fence, uh, pretty durable, um, although it certainly would not retain buffalo. Um, and what's the other one? Windmills. Windmills, oh, Renee. I read Ren the book. All right, you read the book. I choose to believe that you just knew it intuitively, okay. The six-shooter barbed wire and the windmill are the things that made Anglo settlement, Anglo conquest, really, of the Great Plains and regions further west possible. At times, the book reads a little bit like a love letter to his forebears. And again, remember what I said a moment ago, that uh, he said he wrote this in a state of suppressed emotion. Let's talk a little bit about some of those problems. I'm giving you a history of the book. Let's talk about what I think are some of its, some of its key problems. 
This is one of those things you learn in graduate school, how to tear a book apart. Now, web makes it a little easier for us than others because the problems are, I think, a little bit more obvious. But at any rate, I will come back and give him some praise at the end, but we need to go through, um, we need to walk through the fire first and talk about some of the limitations of the book. So despite this lavish praise that it got at the time of publication, which I mentioned earlier, um, Webb had expected criticism. He knew that he was taking a big swing. But wow, did he get it. Infamously, um, at a conference held in the Poconos uh, in Pennsylvania in 1939, there's a group called the Social Science Research Council, um, which was a group of leading academics from across a variety of social science fields, anthropology, political science, history, sociology, and so on. And they chose the Great Plains um, uh, as the subject of a conference featuring uh, what they described as a single highly influential work. And Webbs was the third to get this kind of treatment. This is a really extraordinary gathering of scholars who came together again in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. Uh, the Harvard historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Sr. presided and there were luminaries from all of the other disciplines um, who were there. I'll just say a quick aside, something that I find fascinating is that um, this conference took place in early September 1939. It may have actually sort of begun on September 1st. I'm sure that some of you know what else happened on September 1st, which is the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany. It's incredible to me that these super smart guys, and they were all guys, alas, this is not a very diverse group, um, there is no mention in the proceedings of the conference of what is happening, of the world transforming events that are happening on the other side of the ocean. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Anyway, it was a legendary affair, uh, but not in the best way. The SSRC commissioned a review um, from a very prominent historian, a guy named Fred Shannon, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning historian of the Civil War, but like Webb, um, had come from an agricultural family. Uh, Shannon, like Webb, grew up in pretty straightened circumstances in a farming family. Webb in Texas, Shannon from Illinois, uh, and Shannon had certainly an interest in agricultural history, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why he was selected as Webb's reader. But anyway, this guy, Fred Shannon, uh, delivers a blistering 109-page critique. Can I say that again? 109 pages. And I don't mean 109 manuscript pages. I mean, it's published as a book, um, and it's in small type, single space. That's 109 pages. I've never read anything quite like it before. It was amazing. Um, I'll have a little more to say about that in just a moment. It's something that you can certainly find um, uh, in a lot of libraries. Uh, and it's an extraordinary read. And what I would say for those of us in the world of academia, we are so soft by comparison. I mean, this is just, this, he pummels Webb for 109 pages on all things, big and small. I mean, he probably takes 15 or 20 pages just to argue with Webb's definition definition of the Great Plains. Those of us who studied the Great Plains know that it's always been up for some contest and debate, certainly the Eastern Edge, um, but Shannon would have none of it. He just, he just roasts Webb for page after page after page. I mean, it really is. It's just amazing. My job was like, can he say that? And he did over and over and over again. Okay, Webb was incensed. He was infuriated. He had to be reeled back in by Arthur Schlesinger um, to participate in this uh, um, colloquium. Um, and he, so they ultimately sort of convinced him to come to Pennsylvania, but he declares, quote, I would not prostitute the Great Plains by accepting the Shannon manuscript as an appraisal. <laughs> so Shannon's critique, however, provides a blueprint for later critics of the book. Um, Shannon had a lot to say, and some of it really is, um, Picayunish, as one person described it. But some of the larger points really, I think, uh, do land. And probably one of the reasons Webb was so angry is because he might have even anticipated some of these critiques. But let me go through a couple of them because these are things that other people have hit on uh, in years since, differently than Shannon, but probably using him as a jumping off point. So one thing that Shannon said was that Webb, claiming great originality in this book, uh, in fact, Shannon said it was very derivative of secondary sources and that Webb had neglected to consult much primary source material himself. Webb sort of conceded the point uh, and he said that he skimped on the scholarly apparatus so as, quote, not to clutter up the text. <laughs> 
Um, let me say again that, you know, if you are a scholar, um, or even if you are choosing to write something without necessarily, you know, having scholarly training, you still kind of have to give the evidence. And Webb was like, ah, enough of that. I don't want to clutter up the text with footnotes and such. Just take me at my word, is what he seemed to be saying. But more than that, Fred Shannon hated the sweeping generalizations that Webb made based on his intuition and experience. I told you it was a deeply personal book for Webb. And it really is true that a lot of what he has to say in the book um, is compelling and probably even on some level uh, kind of, and I'll have a little more to say about this at the end as well, it probably makes sense on a gut level, certainly to people who know the planes. Um, but still, it's, it, that's not usually the best way to make an argument in, uh, in, a, in a work of history, is to say, well, it must be true because it sort of fits with my experience. That's pretty much what he said, um, but he was a little bit more coy than that. This is what he actually said. It's published in the transcript of the proceedings. Quote, I have never asserted that the Great Plains is a work of history. To me, it is a work of art. <laughs> kind of love that. I'm not sure you can get away with that at a conference if you get raked over the coals to say, I wasn't writing history, I was writing art. And of course, nobody can criticize art because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Webb's close friend, the uh, famous UT folklorist J. Frank Doby, put it another way, quote, Webb sure doesn't let the facts get in the way of the truth, which I love. <laughs> Years later, after Webb was insulated by all kinds of professional honors. He had two visiting appointments in the United Kingdom. He won two Guggenheim fellowships. Um, uh, I didn't know they gave more than one. They don't give many of those, but Webb won it twice. Uh, and he confessed later on, and he was able to say this because I think he felt that his reputation was sufficiently um, made that he could say this. He confessed that he thought of the book, quote, as an extension and explanation of what I had known firsthand in miniature. In a sense, it was an autobiography, but with scholarly trimmings. <laughs> I love this. Again, all these things that I think many of us would like to be able to say and do, but none of us ever would. So that's sort of one critique, that Webb didn't really cite a lot of other sources, hadn't consulted much primary material, that he wrote a lot based on intuition and experience, that he generalized uh, perhaps crudely. Um, anyway, that's one sort of branch of criticism. The second major critique is what the environmental historian Richard White has termed, quote, crude environmental determinism. In other words, Webb, uh, left no room for things like culture or contingency. That he said because of the environmental conditions on the Great Plains, that the history here really could have only played out a particular way uh, and a pretty narrow set of possibilities. Stiffest challenge to that idea, um, to Webb's determinism, is lying in plain sight. And that is because of the inventions that allowed Anglo-Americans to conquer the nation's midsection all of them were pioneered elsewhere. They were not actually invented here on the Great Plains. The six-shooter, I bet a lot of you know, was invented by Samuel Colt at sea, okay, which is why it's called the Navy Colt. So Colt wasn't even on land, on terra firma, when he came up with the idea for the Colt revolver. The windmill was invented in antebellum Connecticut. And even barbed wire, which I think Webb was most fascinated by, um, that was patented by Joseph Glidden 10 degrees east of this 98 degree fault line that Webb thought was so important. So that's the second criticism, this environmental determinism. But Fred Shannon had less to say about probably the most distressing aspect of, plain, of uh, Webb's book to the modern reader, which is Webb's racism, and would certainly jump out at you if you were to read the book today. You'd be, I think, pretty stunned by some of the things that he wrote and thought. Though he described native peoples of the plains as, quote, by nature more ferocious, implacable, and cruel than other tribes, I think embedded within that assessment was in its own way, kind of a grudging admiration of groups like the Comanches. So it's not a particularly nice or flattering thing to say, but I think Webb, in his own way, probably respected that. I think a lot of Texans um, of Webb's generation grew up hearing plenty of stories about the Comanches. But he had a lot less respect for other Native peoples. And the book's most notorious passage 
Webb, who was writing about the Pueblo Indian origins of the Mestizo population of the modern Southwest, in other words, um, sort of some peoples of Mexican ancestry today, he said that their blood, quote, when compared with that of the Plains Indians, was as ditch water. I mean, it's one of those things that you read that and you're like, it's, though it's the 1930s, I still can't believe that he actually chose to put things that way. Now, apologists, people who would make excuses for Webb, point to his upbringing in Texas by parents who had fled Reconstruction-era Mississippi. But even some of his closest friends conceded the point that Webb was an outlier in terms of some of his attitudes, even by comparison to some of the people of the day. One associate explained his anti-Mexican bigotry this way, quote, subconsciously, Webb still had that Alamo Texas Ranger myth deeply engraved. And this actually showed up most notably in his 1935 study of the Rangers, which even Webb later admitted was wildly imbalanced. And that's a much less good book than The Great Plains. There's really not much you can take. I'm a historian of the Texas Rangers, and I could say that the only part about that book that's really useful is that Webb did a lot of interviews with surviving members of the force who had um, served against the Comanches, say, for instance, or served against um, uh, peoples of Mexican descent uh, in South Texas during the background of the Mexican Revolution. So it's a good kind of compendium of primary sources, but as an interpretive history, it's really pretty warped. Um, and again, even Webb said as much by the end of his career. Webb's own protege, a guy named Joe B. France, put it most damningly, quote, Webb showed strong nativist tendencies and his views on racial matters were not exactly progressive and in fact were even a bit barbaric. That's what one of his protégés said sometime later, notably after Webb had died, but still. Maybe one last bit of evidence that I'd give that may mean a little less to you here, but certainly when I've talked about this book or talked about, um, talked about Webb and the book in this context is uh, in Texas, is the fact that the prominent Mexican-American folklorist um, from the University of Texas, a guy named Americo Paredes, he made his peace with J. Frank Doby, whom he also thought was, you know, kind of a jackass, but he never made time for Walter Prescott Webb, understandably. Okay, so having said all of that, I guess the question then is, can this book be saved? Or as a friend who read an early draft of this essay on which my, this talk is based asked me, why would you even bother? Okay, so in brief, yes, I think this book can be redeemed in part, although I can surely understand if there are some people who might disagree. I think there are three key attributes that underpin the book's enduring reputation as a classic in uh, the field of American history. It starts with its sheer ambition. As remembered years later by uh, the editor-in-chief of Harper's Magazine, uh, and he had commissioned many pieces from Webb um, over the years. Webb was somebody who could really write very well for a crossover audience. He said, quote, Webb wasn't afraid to tackle big subjects. Now and then he would talk, with a mixture of sorrow and amusement and contempt, about fledgling historians who would devote years of labor to some safe, respectable little theme. Dr. Webb preferred subjects that offered plenty of elbow room. I think certainly the Great Plains uh, do that. Nobody has really attempted to write a soup to nuts history of the Great Plains in its entirety since Webb did this almost 100 years ago. So the story of the Great Plains and their absorption, I agree, uh, their absorption into the United States, that is, uh, was a spacious canvas indeed. And even if he generalized, and Webb said as much, he acknowledged this, uh, this was the cost of painting so large a picture. He was a big ideas historian, I would say, in sharp contrast to what one of my grad school professors um, would describe a more nuts and bolts approach. Um, that was certainly Fred Shannon, the guy who wrote this blistering critique. He was much more of a nuts and bolts historian, but Webb was a big ideas guy. The book is truly interdisciplinary in a way that so few works of history that I have ever read are. I mentioned William Cronin's Nature's Metropolis, that's certainly one, because Cronin's as much of a geographer in many ways as he is a historian. And Webb read widely across multiple disciplines, chiefly anthropology and geography, but he read in the hard sciences too, including biology and geology. 
Those are some of, I think, the most important chapters in the book, which explain how the planes came to be. They're not the most exciting reading, but they're really significant in explaining um, sort of the, uh, the ecological evolution of this area. And you might expect that such a book, which is long, it's about 400 pages, um, it's huge, uh, and it's really smart. You might think that it would be off-putting to the lay reader, but Webb wrote with just such an audience in mind. This is another reason why I like the book so much. One colleague explained it this way, that Webb wrote primarily for one person. Again, it will show, be a window into Webb's thinking and also sort of a, a, a window into the Time. This will sound very old-fashioned and, again, um, uh, out of date, but I still think it's revealing that this is what one person thought Webb's imaginary, or Webb's intended audience was. Quote, an imaginary Bostonian who was not a professional historian, writer, or critic, but a man of wide culture who could be interested in a slice of non-Bostonian history. Um, I think that's a pretty narrow audience, potentially. But again, the idea is that Webb is writing for an audience that might not necessarily be drawn to the history of the West. If, you know, sitting in some comfortable library in Boston would think that the only history worth writing would be the history of colonial America or revolutionary America. Webb had other readers in mind. Webb had always dreamed of being a writer, and this is uh, maybe along with the story of how the Great Plains came to be, that cold, rainy night in 1922. There's probably even a better known story about Webb. And in fact, um, when, I was, uh, when I was reading about him, uh, there was a lot to choose from because uh, somebody said that probably no historian has had as much written about him and his works than Cotton Mather, I think, is what, um, what this other writer said. But at any rate, well, the other really famous story that Webb told, which is, this one is documented, um, and it's really, it's deeply moving, that in 1904, Webb was born in 1888. So he was 16 years old, and he was living uh, in an area called the Cross Timbers, which is a really hard scrabble area um, uh, west of Fort Worth. And uh, he grew up very poor. Um, his father was a dirt farmer who occasionally uh, um, uh, augmented his income with um, te doing some, uh, some teaching uh, in uh, local schools. But they lived rurally, and, um, and Webb grew up poor. Uh, and in 1904, uh, he wrote a letter to uh, a Southern literary magazine called The Sunny South, which I don't think has been in publication for a very long time. But anyway, he sent this letter in and basically he was lamenting his fate, that he was a guy who loved to read and loved to write, but how does a kid like him ever manage to be able to make a life or a career out of this considering his pretty you know, uh, straightened circumstances? So he writes this letter and it gets published. And it's spotted um, in the magazine by a guy named William Ellery Hines, who was a toy manufacturer who lived in Brooklyn. And Hines sent Webb um, a whole bunch of reading material, and he sent him a really encouraging note that said something about, like, failure is a word that is not known in the lexicon of young men, or something along those lines. Um, and it changed Webb's life, because even more importantly than that, Hines later funded Webb's study at the University of Texas and allowed him to get a college degree, and it just totally transformed his life. In fact, years later, Webb described it, uh, and Webb was not a religious man, but that it was the best example of Christian charity that he could ever think of. Um, and he spent, actually, he, one of his favorite pieces is the piece that he wrote, I think it's called The Search for William Ellery Hines, that he published in Harper's Magazine, um, I think in the late 1950s, maybe 1957, I can't remember, um, where he went out trying to find this man, or trying to find uh, people, and he was able to track down a few descendants, but he never met him. Um, this was all uh, sort of a relationship that was sort of through correspondence and through these timely arrivals of money that allowed Webb to go to college. Um, and he dedicated, the t I'm not sure it was much of a gift, he dedicated the Texas Rangers to William Ellery Hines. Better if he'd given it, recommended, or excuse me, um, you know, uh, uh, inscribed it, uh, inscribed the Great Plains to him. Anyway, Webb had much to say about writing. Uh, in a piece for Harper's, he lamented the rise of what he called, quote, scientific history and you'll appreciate this, um, out of quote, which arose the idea that a great gulf exists between truth and beauty. 
such that the real scholar must choose truth and somehow it is better if it is made so ugly that nobody could doubt its virginity. <laughs> that wasn't published. Um, Harper's decided to pass on that piece. Um, he divided university-based historians into two camps. Quote, those who can't write and those who can but don't. Webb put himself as a member of a very small group of those who do um, and who consider writing an art. And the Great Plains is replete with really great visual sentences like this one. This is what he says uh, in the introduction. Quote, east of the Mississippi, civilization stood on three legs, land, water, and timber. West of the Mississippi, not one but two of those legs were withdrawn, water and timber, and civilization was left on just one leg, land. Small wonder that it toppled over in temporary failure. You can just see that. But the most important thing that Webb did was he defined the West in terms of aridity. He settled on the 98th meridian as its eastern edge. That any place that gets less than 20 inches of rain per year, those parts of the continent or really he was, wasn't thinking about Canada. Those parts of the United States could be considered Western. Now, of course, there are some problems with that. The Pacific Northwest gets a lot more rain uh, than, um, than 20 inches per year. But generally speaking, um, this is a regional definition that really has some teeth, I think. And certainly it stood in contrast to Frederick Jackson Turner, who had defined the West in 1893 as a process, as a frontier that slowly moved across the continent from east to West. Webb said, no, you can actually point to a map. This is where the West begins. And he was less interested with where it ends. I suspect he assumed that it was the Pacific Ocean. Um, but he certainly could sort of fix that Eastern boundary, which had been so elusive to that point. Uh, he makes his point even more finely. And I'm almost, speaking of finally, finally, I'm almost done. But he makes his point even more finely in a piece that he wrote in Harper's in 1957 called The American West Perpetual Mirage. And it was loathed by Westerners who took offense at what he described as sort of its deficiency. He said that the West was deficient in a variety of ways, not only water, but also in terms of culture and sophistication and so on. Now remember, this is a place that he loved. So he didn't say that he was criticizing it for the sake of criticizing it. He was criticizing it in order um, so that the people who lived here would know their own past, who would know their own history. But this generated an enormous pushback. And I'm trying to find one wonderful quotation. Um, somebody, a guy writing from Denver, was absolutely irate. Let's see if I can find it. Yes. So the Denver Post, actually not a guy, it was the editorial board, wrote it, took out a full page editorial condemning the piece uh, that began this way. Listen, Dr. Walter Prescott Webb, you better take off your glasses and your PhD. You've picked a fight. So Westerners hated Webb for pointing out these deficiencies in their home region. But again, as he said, all he wanted to do was to help them better understand the place they lived. Okay, so final thoughts. What's the verdict on this? Can this book be saved? Well, yes, I think that it can. I think ultimately it is redeemed by its writerly quality, by its sweeping ambition, by its insights, no matter the fact that it is compromised in ways by its environmental determinism and its racism among other problems. Um, I came to see it as a deeply flawed masterpiece. I think that's pretty rare these days. I'm not sure if I can think of another book that I would sort of ascribe that to. Um, this is what Donald Worcester said, a very prominent historian of the Great Plains, an environmental historian who grew up in Kansas, or was born in Kansas, raised in California by uh, parents who fled the Dust Bowl, but found his way back ultimately to Kansas. And this is what he said. And Worcester is probably Webb's chief intellectual descendant. He said, I know in my bones, if not always through my education, that Webb was right in terms of where he drew the boundaries around the Great Plains. But it's not just Donald Worcester, who don't take just his word, uh, really prominent scholars like Jacques Barzun and William S. McNeil, who was a really significant um, sort of European historian with interest in the environment, um, also were huge fans of the book. 
They still sell an average of 575 copies a year, maybe more, with its fancy new cover. That's an extraordinary number of copies for a book that was published nearly, it's an extraordinary number of copies for a book published by an academic press, period. Um, but especially for a book that is now nearly 100 years old. And I think one of the reasons why it endures is it speaks to the present, because Webb was writing this book in the 1920s. Uh, it's published in 1931, but he was writing it in the 20s, and he wrote against the backdrop of the wheat bonanza of that period, of the post-World War I period. But he grasped, even at the time, that these were great sort of salad days, as it were, on the Great Plains. He knew that the American approach to the region spelled trouble. And at the end of the book, one of the things that he predicts is conflict over water, which, of course, I mean, and I have to tell you this, that's probably one of the great challenges that we Westerners face in the 21st century. Just read a big story, I'm sure a lot of you saw it as well, in the New York Times, it was interactive, um, showing just the massive depletion of groundwater, which of course, you know, since even we in Texas depend to a degree on the Oglala, but especially the Edwards Aquifer, these places are being drained at a rate that is ultimately unsustainable. Webb saw this to a degree, even in the 1920s and 1930s. And the big thing that he understood was that the environment, in addition to providing opportunities, enormous opportunities, um, but it also imposes limitations. And I think this is something that we would do well to think a lot about um, right now and going forward. Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate it. And if you've got some, I'm happy to take questions as long as they're friendly. No, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions. And I get to run the mic around so that everyone can hear. Uh, before questions, um, especially folks, and there's cookies over there. Please make sure there aren't any of that. Yeah, don't, don't miss cookies. Um, and also, there are books for sale in the back when you're finished. And I forgot you wrote the introduction to the Beaverman, and that's one of my favorite books. Oh, um, so I, I love doing that. And I guess I used to um, any questions? I'll bring you a mic. Oh, Nate's going to ask me a tough one, I know. Hi, Andy. Hello, I'm bracing myself. So, in the book that I co-edited with uh, Sandra Anthony, uh, I started the introduction by quoting Walter Prescott and saying it was odd for a book on women's history to start with a quote by a male historian, but you kind of have to be because we just love to hate him. Ah, <laughs> Uh, what is, you talked about his broad environmental determinism, his racism. What do you say about sexism? Do I, get the, do I get the mic back for that? Good. Um, <laughs> what about his sexism? What about his sexism? <laughs> there you are, Doctor. Yes. Uh, well, that is um, uh, an app. I'm trying to find where, because Webb, to a degree, predicted this. Oh, I'm going to put this in the stand for a second. Uh, yeah, it, you know it's it's amazing, um, but I want to I want to see if I can read him in his own words because it'll 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 make you um, cringe. Um, so this is the very last chapter, <laughs> title of which is "Mysteries of the Great Plains." Women were obviously very mysterious to him. Um, so. Of a chapter of maybe 30 or 40 pages, there's one section, and Renee, you are, you're actually, you're wrong. It's a, not two pages, it's a page and a half. And this is one of those questions that he didn't get around to answering, but he says, the heading is, what has been the spiritual effect of American adventure in the Great Plains on women? And then he says, since practically this whole study has been devoted to the men, uh, they will receive scant attention here, meaning in this next page and a half. The Great Plains in the early period was strictly a man's country, more of a man's country than any other portion of the frontier. Men loved the plains, or at least those who stayed there did. There was zest to the life, adventure in the air, freedom from restraint, on and on and on. So even in trying to characterize the experience of women in the plains, he frames it in terms of um, in opposition to sort of this sort of wonderful male, manly man experience. So, uh, and that was actually the other, that was probably the chief criticism of the friend of mine who read this, who is a uh, women's and gender historian, who was like, aside from all the other things that are wrong with this book, um, the sheer absence, the sort of inattention to the experience of women who, as any of you who know anything about the history of the Plains or the history of the West, women are 
obviously uh, absolutely indispensable. Um, you know, in Native society, in Anglo pioneer society, you can't write the history of the West. Uh, any more than you can write it without Native peoples, you can't write it without the experience of women. And um, I suspect that Webb told you all, that what you saw right there is what you get. That because in his mind it was a manly man's frontier, that women were basically along for the ride. Um, and that their experience was simply not worth investigating. That is another significant deficiency in the book, for certain. So why, so what did you ultimately do? Did you, did you, did you begin it with Webb? Or did. you did? Yes, and you know, Webb set the tone. If this is a regional history, um, Webb did not make room for many people in this besides white men. And uh, I'm teaching my women in this class right now, and so we love to hate women. Uh, and we really love the fact that he uh, talks about the winch driving women crazy. But never the men. <laughs> no, and you should read, uh, in, well, in Old Jewels, of course, when uh, Harriet Henrietta goes crazy, you know. So I, I looked up some stats, and men and women went crazy about the same percentages. Um, but Webb kind of forgot that. He, well, he didn't check his records. Jerry did check his Right. Because he knew in his gut. He knew in his gut. I mean, and that's, I think that's really, I, I think ultimately that's the answer, is that Webb had no, made no effort Webb made no effort to try to understand the experiences really of any other people besides, uh, I mean, it was kind of run through his own gut. Ultimately, that was his, um, maybe his chief archival repository uh, was his stomach um, from an intuitive perspective. And so on some level, it tracks that he would have given, that he makes no attempt to understand the experiences of native people besides setting them as a foil for uh, Anglo pioneers who are moving west and why women just really don't, don't feature in the book at all. I mean, a page and a half. Is there any evidence that Shannon and Webb had had any prior interaction leading to the 121 pages of critique? I just wonder if there was like a prior grudge or prior. <laughs> no, I've got. Um, just I, because that seems like an extreme critique of some kind, or like they had some kind of relationship, maybe. That led oh, to that. Totally. Now I'll let Kurt bring the microphone back. While I'm doing that. I'm going to look up something. I'm so happy that Kurt was kind enough to bring me a copy of my own book. Um, okay, thank you, Kurt. Well, it's not really my book, it's Webb's book. Um, so no, uh, they did not have an experience, uh, so far as I know, they had not encountered each other beforehand. Here's a little bit of what I can say, I wanna get this right. I had more fun writing the footnotes to this piece than the text itself. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna read, it's easier than trying to, I'll make it longer if I try to put it in story form. So despite Webb's bitterness over the affair with Shannon, he mended fences in a most amusing fashion at the 1954 annual meeting of what became the Organization of American Historians. As vice president of the OAH, it was Webb's duty to introduce Fred Shannon, who was then serving as the president, at the presidential dinner, which was packed because of the men's fabled confrontation 15 years earlier. Webb began dryly, but eventually tipped his hand when he joked that, quote, my knowledge of the speaker's skill and ability as a critic is intimate and has the validity of a primary source. Um, but apparently that was the moment when they, uh, uh, or when sort of Webb set down his, uh, well, I don't believe Webb actually ever set down his grudge. I don't think that he ever met a grudge that he couldn't keep. Um, but what I will say is that uh, Fred Shannon had a reputation for being um, particularly difficult. Um, uh, and so I think that it was a particularly bad match. Um, maybe a great match. I mean, I had so much fun reading his 109-page critique. I'm so glad that it exists. Um, but, uh, but I think that maybe Arthur Schlesinger might have found somebody who would have been a little less tendentious. Okay. It's been my impression that Texans are um, particularly a, a strong and partisan supporters of their heroes, however they define them. How is uh, as Webb looked at today in Texas? Is that ever, they never give up a hero, uh, you know, however they define one. And I'm just wondering, is he still, just tell us a little about 
Webb's um, aura in Texas today? Sure. It's a great question. So I think the short answer would be that yes, they have not given him up as a hero. Um, the best example that I can give you, uh, some of you may know the place or know of the place, um, there's a wonderful swimming hole outside of Aust or in Austin called Barton Springs. Um, and there's a statue there uh, called Three Friends. Um, was, I think it was constructed in the 90s, maybe in the early 2000s. It's a bronze and it features Walter Prescott Webb uh, and his two uh, really good pals um, who were sort of the three great men of the University of Texas in the 1940s and 50s. J. Frank Doby, the folklorist being one, and then Roy Betacek, who was a naturalist, the other. Um, I think that, to, yes, even today, there are people who knew that I was working on this who had now well into their 80s, people who had had Webb as an undergraduate. Webb was still teaching when he died in a car accident in 1963. So I've had people who had him in the 1950s come to me and say he was just an extraordinary teacher and a great mentor. Um, but the larger point has some of this criticism sort of seeped in. Uh, I, think, I, I think it has. And I think that particularly with um, uh, the rise of Chicano his history, particularly. Americo Paredes being a, a, sort of a forerunner, writing in the 50s and 60s. But I think that Webb's reputation has certainly taken a hit in the academy. Um, I'm not sure how many people outside of the academy pay much attention to him. But the fact that the statue, I'm not sure that that's, maybe the best way to say it is this. I think that statue that was constructed in the 90s or the 2000s probably wouldn't be constructed today. On the other hand, I don't think it's in danger of going anywhere, at least not yet. Um, I think partly because people may not care enough about um, three academics, uh, but I think also because I'm not sure if word of Webb's um, feelings have really penetrated far enough beyond the academy to get people in the city of Austin sufficiently um, motivated to do something about the existence of that statue. Um, I think among academics, probably most people feel somewhere between maybe the way that Renee and I do, downright hostility, understandable, um, for Renee, and some um, deep ambivalence on, on my part. But like I said, they also think there's a way in which he's probably becoming increasingly irrelevant. Uh, partly because of the limitations of the book, but also because there's not a lot of books that are 90 or 100 years old um, that really get a lot of attention, um, even, uh, even if they are as original as this in a lot of ways. I should probably know this, but so how does Sandoz and Webb intersect? Like, is he cited in the Beaverman? Anybody in the room can answer that, I guess. Yeah, I may need some help on that one. <laughs> She admired that's, a, that's a great question. I gave a little thought to that, but only as I was driving from the airport uh, yesterday down here and thinking, I wonder if there's some ways that I can put Webb and Sandoz in conversation. Um, if there's a book of hers in which Webb might make an appearance, my guess that it would be The Cattleman, uh, because Webb was absolutely uh, one of the problems with with this book, but especially the Texas Rangers book, is he was just inordinately impressed by cowboys and by cattlemen and by rangers uh, and uh, sort of uncritical in his reflection. Um, and he argued that the only true American literature is the literature of the open range. Uh, that is how, uh, it's another one of the mysteries of the Great Plains. Um, and having read a lot of that, I, yeah, I hope that is not the only contribution to an American literary tradition. Um, but the short answer is, so Sandoz uh, dies in 1966 um, and was writing, you know, throughout much of the 20th century. I, I would suspect, I have to believe that she must have read The Great Plains. I think it would be hard not to if writing about the range cattle trade. Um, what Webb might have read of hers, I don't know. Uh, I doubt the Beaverman, uh, only because that's more, I mean, Webb's interests were really focused. One of the uh, criticism of the book, which is reasonable, is that it's ultimately, it's not even a book about the Great Plains, it's really a book about sort of Texas and the Southern Plains. So I don't know if they're, how much their interests would have intersected outside of the cattlemen. Um, but I would also say that uh, Sandoz, um, Good a writer as Webb is, uh, he's not in Mari Sandoz's league. And as Shannon was saying, and talking about um, uh, about 
sort of the significance of, uh, of Sandoz's work. She, I think, was much more interested in the lives of the people that she wrote about. I mean, I did Crazy Horse, just an amazing book, a work of extraordinary imagination, I think, in an attempt to try to understand what that world looked like through the eyes of somebody who had a very different set of experiences than hers. I don't think, I don't think Webb was writing on the same plane. Sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't apologize to him. No, no. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I should have given a shout out to the students. Y'all are amazing to come and stay. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, we've heard a lot about why this is a kind of an archaic book. But are there any redemptive qualities? I mean, why, why should one read this book today? What can we learn from it? What can we extract from it? I mean, it's purposeful, I think. Sure. Sure. Um, I think, I, I, part, I think part of it is, um, is uh, his attention to uh, the importance of style um, and the fact that he really he did try to write for that elusive crossover audience. I think uh, that most of my um, academic pals would agree that as historians uh, or scholars in other disciplines, we don't do that maybe with the same, um, with a level of attention that we, in, and intention that we maybe could and should, which is why so many of the books that are read and consumed by the public um, are written by journalists, a lot of whom get a lot of things right, but often flatten the story and its complexities. The best example I can give you is a book called Empire of the Summer Moon. Do some of you all know that? Wildly popular in Texas by the author S.C. Gwynn, um, which is a rip-roaring story of Quanta Parker, but wow, does it make the story so much less complicated and thus less interesting and less important. Um, so I think Webb was writing as an academic, but able to reach a crossover audience. But the most important thing by far is, again, his ability to define the West as a region. Because up until that point in time, um, people really, and even after, uh, my mom learned going to school in the 50s and 60s, in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, sorry, mom. Um, her version of history that she learned, I think most people in American public schools at that time were learning Frederick Jackson Turner's version of not just the West, but the whole sweep and scope of American history. Webb, he didn't put an end to that, but he gave us a different way of thinking about the West as a discrete region. Um, and I think the other part about Webb, he's not the first to do this, but he does it probably better than anybody to that point at least, is thinking about the environment as a historical actor in its own right. Um, the environment acts in addition to being act, acted upon. That it's that reciprocal relationship between people and the natural world that is so important. And Webb got that, uh, I think, uh, early on and in a way that um, I think few people were able to write about quite so uh, eloquently and um, intuitively. There it is. Uh, and I think that's just really important in setting the stage for so much good work in environmental history and in Western history and in regional history more generally, because Webb, this book really is in its own way, kind of the first foray into American regional history, period. I'm not doing any violence, I think, to colonial American historians or people who are writing on other places and times. But I think Webb, in terms of thinking about what makes a region a region, environmentally and ecologically speaking, in addition to just the people who live there, I think Webb was ahead of his time and gave us a model for what that might look like, even if it is not a terribly inclusive history. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes this portion. <laughs> Thank you. Give you a hand for our presenter. Thank you all.